All right, welcome back everyone. And um, yeah, so delighted to welcome you to this next session here. And this is the Gaventa lecture. And I don't wanna embarrass Bill too much more than we already have. Um, but last night we were talking about how uh, there was a time after a decade of the Institute, um, Bill was interrupted on stage to say, you know, thank you for all you've done. And we would like to name a lecture after you going forward. And really the intent here is to keep Bill's spirit kind of alive and thriving within the Institute because he's done such a wonderful job of bringing people together, bringing topics together in these intersections are really are what's so key to the Institute. So just read the, the description here. In the spirit of the first decade of the Institute of the Theology and Disability, the Bill Gaventa lecture highlights the ways in which theology and disability intersect with other disciplines and perspectives. These intersections provide rich opportunities to illuminate, complement, and advance scholarship and practice at the intersections of disability and theology. The Institute welcomes and respects difference and diversity, bringing together disabled and non-disabled people with varied professional and personal experiences from across faith traditions. This plenary seeks to enhance participants' capacity to engage with diverse disciplines and perspectives on disability. So that's why I'm so delighted to uh, welcome Rabbi Julia Rosemary for today's session. Um, Rabbi Julia Watts-Belser, probably about four years ago was the first time that I had the pleasure of, of hearing from you. And for me, she has the ability to help Jewish texts come alive with evocative imagery, kind of similar to some of the, the pictures that we saw yesterday. And I was just blown away um, and I'm so excited to welcome you here today with us virtually. Um, you've been a, a friend and a faculty for the Institute for so many years. I'm so grateful for you. She's a scholar, activist, spiritual teacher, rabbi. She's a professor of Jewish studies at Georgetown University, core faculty in Georgetown's disability studies program, where she brings Jewish texts into conversation queer disability and feminist ethics. Her most recent scholarly book is Rabbanic, Rabbanic Tales of Destruction, Gender, Sex, and Disability in the Ruins of Jerusalem. Her next book, which we're excited about, Breath and Bone, Disability, Politics, and the Bible, will be coming out in 2023 with Beacon Press. A longtime advocate for disability and gender justice, she co-authored the Health Handbook for Women with Disabilities, de developed in collaboration with disability activists from 42 countries to help challenge the root causes of poverty, gender, violence, and discri dis disability discrimination. She directs a project on disability, climate change, and environmental justice. And she's a passionate wheelchair hiker and lover of wild places. And then we had an opportunity to hear from Rosemary yesterday. And as uh, Bill was, was sharing in our first Zoom conversations, it just struck me uh, what a voracious and incisive curiosity Rosemary has. And it's something that I think is so needed in our faith communities, in our academic institutions. Um, and each of us left those meetings with a list, a huge list of names and topics to be researching. It was edifying for all of us. I do want to just read her, her bio here as well. Um, Rosemary Garland Thompson is a professor emerita of English and bioethics at Emory University and a visiting professor of healthcare ethics at UCLA. Her recent work focuses on medical humanities, healthcare ethics, and diversity and inclusion initiatives that go beyond compliance. She's currently a senior advisor and fellow at the Hastings Center and a fellow at the Center for Genetics and Society. She is chief project advisor for the National Endowment for the Humanities, Public Conversations, The Art of Flourishing, Conversations on Disability and Technology, a 2020 National Endowment for the Humanities Public Scholar, and a Phi Beta Kappa Visiting Scholar for 21-22. She is author and editor of several books, um, a couple of which we have there in the resource room as well including about us, essays from the New York Times about people 
uh, about disability by people with disabilities, staring how we look, and extraordinary bodies figuring disability in American culture and literature. She is co-editor of Oxford University Press's new book, Disability, Ethics, and Society. Let's give a huge hand to Julia and Rosemary for the final submission. Thank you. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Bill. Uh, thank you, everyone here. Uh, and thank you, Julia, for being my colleague and uh, beloved friend. Um, I'm honored and delighted to be here with you today. Um, and we are here together um, in the middle of things in media res. Um, and I've been very moved by the gathering and the solidarity um, that I've experienced here. Um, and want to try to honor the, um, this gathering um, in the way that I might be able to honor a gathering, a community uh, like this. And so one of the things uh, that I can do or that we can do is that um, Julia and I can have this conversation which is quite remarkable. Um, we've known each other for a long time and we haven't been together in person for a long time as many people have not. So it's, it's um, uh, like Russell, I'm, I'm filled with feeling uh, uh, today about this. But what we decided to do is um, for me to talk a bit about the kind of work I've been doing. And um, uh, I wanted to to talk about um, world building um, and how, what kind of world building um, I do and what kind of world building uh, Julia and I have done together um, and to invite us to think about how we can do we, the community gathered here today, can do world building in different ways together. So um, I, I want to begin with something that uh, Russell's talk made me think about. Um, Russell spoke to us about Black liberation theology. Um, and that is some, it, I always thought it was kind of corny but it's still really strongly in the back of my mind. And that is the idea of grow, grow where you're planted. Um, so each of us is, um, uh, I like pretentious language, emplaced uh, in the world somewhere. Um, here we are here now. Each of us has what might be called a sector or a place from which we can build worlds in whatever way we can. Um, so I'm gonna call attention to the generative possibility of like bodies in place. Um, we talk a lot about exclusion, but I want us to think about uh, where we actually are and how we can, I don't like this word, but let me say it, mobilize the uh, institutions, the places, the spaces, the buildings, the families, the communities uh, that, we, that we're in, physically, literally in as embodied human beings to do the kind of work that we keep all calling for together, whether that's liberation work, um, uh, justice work, uh, theological work, knowledge building work. Um, so let me tell you a little bit then about uh, what I'm thinking about and trying to do. And again, I wanna say that everything I do, I do from where I am 
and what kind of work I can do. So I'm in the knowledge making business because I got to go to school. I didn't have very good education, but I got to go to school. And after I got out of school, I had to have a job. And when I was in school, there were a lot of things I couldn't do. But one of the things I could do is um, read. And I like to read. And uh, so I read stories. And uh, I had to study something. So I studied literature and English. And I got a degree from my state university. And I had to have a job. So I got a job as an English teacher. And I've been an English teacher ever since. And that's kind of how it works for all of us. You grow where you're planted. And one thing leads to another thing. So I ended up, you know, in this long journey, if you will, and um, uh, having the opportunity to go work at Emory University. Um, and I went there in the year 2001, I think, or 2002, to work with my beloved friend and colleague, Nancy Easlin. And we did some things together there uh, because we had met at uh, the Society for Disability Studies uh, annual conference. Um, we had done some things together at uh, what it's AAR American. Uh, That's the back. American Academy of Religion. I'm sorry. Thank you. Uh, Julia and I met when she was doing, a, was it a postdoc or a fellowship or something at Harvard University? Because I had somehow managed to have somebody give me some money to go to the Radcliffe Institute um, at Harvard and spend a year. Um, and my point is, <laughs> you know, everybody go where you can and do what you can do. And in my estimation, it's a miracle any of us can do anything. But, um, you know, this is, this is how it works, right? Um, and this is what working together is. And so here we are together in this room doing world building together. So I was very influenced by Nancy Eastland's work and by the work of other uh, people working in disability theology. And when I tried to think about getting into a different place, literally um, moving my office from because I had an office, it was thrilling, from one, uh, one building in my school, Emory University, to another building in my school. It was a way of entering into a different community to do a slightly different piece of work. So I've been trying to learn about theology, about religious studies, um, and to take what it is that I know and put it there to do the kind of world building that I can do from what I know, from my perspective, my place, my emplacement in the world. And so I've been thinking about what I call the moral work of cultural iconography, um, because what I know how to do, because I went to school, and I read stories and I studied about reading stories and I studied about what stories could do in the world. And what I decided to do was to think about how stories are carried in things. So stories are carried in books, stories are carried in uh, novels and poetry and the kinds of things that English teachers deal with, but stories are carried everywhere in the world in things. So I wanted to try to think uh, about um, how stories are carried in uh, public works of art, if we want to talk about it that way, how stories are carried in 
um, things that are given life in some way by the stories they carry, by the encounters between human beings going through the world and encountering things that have stories in them. And because I love uh, art and literature and those kinds of high culture things that I never, never um, had any access to or experience with when I was um, growing up, um, I landed on uh, Michelangelo's Pieta to think about that. Um, I've actually seen it. Um, and I've seen many versions of it in the world. And I find it very moving for many, many reasons. Um, because it's a mother and child. Can I pause here, Rosemary, to offer an image description of this, the image that we've just shared on the screen? Right. Um, it's a mother and child, and the mother is um, Mary, uh, and she's holding on her lap. Yeah, she's, she's cradling, really, yeah. the body well, of her. Maybe, maybe you could do this, Julia. Sure, so sure, sure, sure. That's fine. Right. I'm having some difficulty. So this is a statue um, carved in cream marble. It depicts the Virgin Mary cradling the body of her son, Jesus, in death after his crucifixion. And in the foreground is his thin, mostly naked body, which is laying on her lap. And his arms, his legs, and his feet are visible and exposed. There's something else you want to draw our attention to, Rosemary. Feel feel free, but I, I think that might serve as an as a as an image description to work with. Um, thank you for that really powerful image description. Uh, one of the things that um, seems so important about um, a statue like this is its materiality and uh, its placement in the world. So. Uh, marble statues, let's say, or works of art, or what I call sacred iconography, um, are replicated in many, many places. So even though I uh, had the opportunity to behold this statue when I traveled, um, I've seen versions of it, many, many versions of it that look a lot like this one, that are configured similarly that are replicas, if you will, of this um, in many places. But I've also seen many, many other uh, choreographies of embodiment, how's that for pretension, that, um, that suggest the same kind of relationship. And they are made in the world to be, to be studied, uh, they are made as uh, objects of witness, and they are also made as what we might call didactic objects. That is to say, they are to tell a story, they are to teach, uh, and they are available and open to public viewing because of the various places they are. And so I'm, I'm very interested in thinking about the work of looking, beholding, um, images such as this, to think about things such as uh, what I call now the, the ethics of care, to think about uh, the work of the world uh, in sustaining human embodiment, and uh, the work of the world that is often done by women, but not exclusively, uh, to care for bodies, whether those bodies are understood as disabled bodies or, uh, or non-disabled bodies, but rather the work of the world to care for uh, human bodies that are enfleshed and vulnerable. And um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about this um, 
cultural iconography, that is the, um, the relational choreography, if you will, of, um, of care ethics. And um, I've found that there are many, many uh, works uh, that can be, be beheld, uh, that can witness these kinds of relationships. And, and maybe we can take a look together for a minute at the other uh, piece of art that um, I'm offering up. Okay, so here's the second piece. This is Sam Jinx, Still Life, Pieta, 2007. It's a contemporary, highly realistic sculpture that mirrors the pose of Michelangelo's Pieta. A seated white man wearing a black sweater and a gray blazer cradles the body of an old man. The deceased lies on a white blanket. His body is naked and his ribs and wrinkles are visible to the viewer. Thank you for your beautiful voice, um, Rabbi Julia. <laughs> um, I want to mention one more thing about uh, the potential of sculpture and art uh, that is particularly vivid uh, in these two um, pieces of art, public art really in some way. Uh, and that is the, um, the potential for experience that can come through touching. So both of these works of art, uh, both of these pietas um, uh, represent uh, human encounters with one another, the encounters um, uh, of the flesh. They represent care, but they also represent human touching. And they are works of art, but they are objects that um, are not accessible to people who um, are blind or to people who do not best access the world visually. And so they ask us to think about um, how these actual pieces might be available tactily or through haptic experience, which I think is a really interesting enterprise uh, that I've been working with, whatever that means, uh, with some colleagues, primarily uh, my colleague um, in the English department at UC Berkeley, whose name is Georgina Kleeg, K-L-E-E-G-E, -E -E, um, who thinks about access for blind people um, and people with visual impairments to art, because of course, what we know is you can't touch the art. So um, there are really interesting initiatives um, in art museums brought forward about how people in general could have what might be called tactile or haptic access to this kind of image, this kind of art. So, of course, you can't touch the Michelangelo's Pieta, but um, tactile models exist, um, uh, description exists. So that is a, a, a small kind of side project that could be understood as disability justice in its very broadest sense in some way. So there are lots of, I think, important world building and knowledge making um, opportunities uh, in uh, thinking about uh, pietas and thinking about uh, representations of human vulnerability and disability in art. Um, and so I'm going to stop there. Beautiful. I want in just a moment. I, I'll we'll close down the um, the slides so that um, I become visible again on the screen. But before we do, I I want to just draw. Um, uh, those of you who are visually oriented, I want to draw your attention to one element of this sculpture that really speaks to me. And that's the moment where the, the 
hand of the seated man reaches forward and around. You can see his fingers just um, like very tactily close to the chest of the elder. And as you were, as you were talking, Rosemary, it, uh, it occurred to me that that is a moment, even though I can't touch the art, and even though I haven't been able to touch really much of anything outside of my home, haven't spent a lot of time touching any people beyond the very intimate circle of my COVID safer space. There's something about the, for me, the sight of that moment of hand touching naked skin that feels like a reminder, like it's almost like a portal, an opening up of passage to a realm of touch. So of course, for all of us in different ways, right? We might need different kinds of portals to different forms of experience. One that is visually oriented will work for some, but not for all. But it's, it's really interesting to me to think as you're, as you're talking, Rosemary, about the way that art opens up or can might open up certain kinds of access to a realm of feeling even if it isn't part of our current embodied experience. And I, I think that's one of the things that art does is that it, it asks us to move, it invites us to move into a different realm, a realm of, of affect and emotion of feeling where our bodies are affected by what we see or sense or touch or otherwise perceive and know. And it, it asks us to witness uh, through the story that the art tells, and it tells the story in many ways. And it is particularly, I think, challenging and interesting to think about various modes of sensory perception uh, that, that might be available in art. And so to call attention as you did to uh, flesh on flesh, if you will, and that representation uh, and those very powerful indentations that you see in human flesh represented there, to think about ways uh, that that can be made narrated, if you will, made accessible, is the kind of work that you and I do in the world. Right, right. So. I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, you mentioned that you're interested in what these images might do in terms of care ethics. And I wonder if you could just Tell us a little bit about some of what attracts you or draws you to, um, to whether that's Michelangelo or Sam Jinks, what is it, what's some of the work or some of the story that is most speaking to you through these images? Well, care ethics actually is a, um, it's a knowledge enterprise, if you will, that I think many of us know about that um, has many roots but it comes in part out of um, a transformation um, of knowledge and how knowledge is institutionalized um, that, that took place when um, let's say universities and uh, higher education started recognizing the uh, work of women in the world. So this movement, um, which is a knowledge movement, as I said, I, I think that's a good word to use, uh, started uh, around in the 1980s in higher education, uh, which it, it was part of a, a general recognition, um, Russell was talking about this and I talk about it, that came with uh, 
the civil and human rights movement that pointed out that many perspectives and many people had been excluded from participating in um, all sectors across uh, society. And so what we had in higher education was the entry into higher education of people who had been excluded generally before, uh, people of color, women in general. And when folks from those groups came into the enterprise of knowledge making that was higher education, they simply changed how things were done. And one of the most important elements that happened starting around in the 1980s was the development of knowledge fields like African-American studies or women and gender studies. And there were particular transformations in knowledge that were very important, like the project that was called Women's History, uh, that, uh, for example, um, a historian uh, I believe at the University of Wisconsin named Gerda Lerner, as well as many others, um, began to write about what was called the lost history of women. Um, in my field, in literary studies, in English, um, uh, women and other people too, not just women, but the, the leadership tended to come from women, women, uh, white women, black women, uh, uh, women of color, women who were there in the universities that had been integrated into what had been uh, segregated spaces largely before that, uh, began to recuperate knowledge. And one of the things that Gerda Lerner said, which I thought was really marvelous, is she said, uh, women have always contributed to culture and to history. It's the story of that contribution that has been lost. And so that happened in, art, it happened in literary studies, it happened in history, it happened pretty much everywhere, uh, not only in terms of women as an excluded group, uh, but in terms of other uh, groups that had been uh, people uh, in groups that had been excluded um, uh, in the segregation of the world that was broken up by the civil and human rights movements and the kinds of changes that came from that. And that opened up whole new ways of thinking about uh, knowledge products and what counts as knowledge and who changes knowledge. And that was very, um, it was transformational for all of us. And we are all heirs to that now in ways that I think are really important. What is that? I'm, I'm thinking now specifically about the kind of disability story that these two images that you shared tell. And I'm curious, um, I think I have a lot of a lot of questions about them from the perspective of disability, the politics of representation, the implications. I wonder if we might talk a little bit about what's um, uh, some of what's attracting you here and also um, whether you have some questions about these yeah. images. I didn't well. really get to care ethics as fully as That's I right. should. You can have. skip that if you, yeah. Well, no, I wanted to, to make the connection. So because women have historically been charged with the care of the body, mm. uh, with uh, the care of, of uh, of bodies uh, when they are most vulnerable. Of course, they're vulnerable throughout life, but um, the care of bodies at the beginning, the care of people at the beginning of life um, through sustaining uh, people, cleaning them, feeding them, caring for them, keeping them warm, sustaining life. That has been the work of, uh, of women historically everywhere and also uh, the care of bodies at the end of life. Uh, that is to say, uh, the, the preparation of the dead was always done by women. Uh, well, that's not entirely true, but primarily done with, uh, by women. Um, for example, nursing uh, has been overwhelmingly 
a woman's profession. Uh, so there are all sorts of places um, in all sorts of institutions where women have been assigned historically and still are the work of care in the world. And so from that recognition came uh, the, the, the field or the enterprise of care ethics, thinking about the ethics of care and thinking about how it's gendered and how it's carried out in, in the world. And so uh, I think that these representations are particularly powerful in that respect. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, that attention to the, the work of doing the, the, the sacrality, right? Honoring the sacredness of doing the tangible acts, the physical tangible acts of care is a very striking element for me and something that really moves me in what you're bringing out here of, uh, with, these, with these images. If I may, I want to, to raise one thing that, that I'm not sure what to do with, that I, I, that I find troubling, and that's the way in which I fear disability in and through these images may also get used as a kind of icon of lament. There is a risk, I find, in thinking about, in using disability to think through the human experience of vulnerability. That is to say, we, we, we often know or often acknowledge implicitly that all bodies experience vulnerability, that all bodies need care. And yet, often I find, and I find this especially in religious contexts, that there is a tendency to use disability and disabled people's bodies as stand-ins for the experience of vulnerability. I think of this sometimes as like being a vulnerability object, sort of being a, a kind of on display as a, um, as a site of vulnerability. And I find this very um, um, frustrating, right? It chafes. There are absolutely moments when I, I am so in touch with my own vulnerability. There are moments where I know my own vulnerability is in fact heightened by disability, though I would more frequently say that it's heightened by ableism. But I, I am also really interested in thinking together about how we might equip those of us invested in religious discourse or affected and moved by these or other images, sacred images, sacred acts of caring and tending to, to shift those power dynamics so that the caring doesn't only, so that the vulnerability doesn't only flow or fall in, in, one, in one direction. I'm curious if you have thoughts about that or, or um, thoughts about where we might, where we might go with that, that sort of concern. Well, I think we are right to, that there are perils everywhere. Um, Julia has, among other of our colleagues have, um, have written and, and talked often about the concept of disability joy. And um, we certainly want to bring forward uh, disability joy. And of course, it's, it's hard to find disability joy in these uh, images of lament and care. Um, absolutely. Um, but I also think that they become a opportunity for conversations about what I call universalizing disability, uh, to think about uh, people with disabilities not as 
exceptions, but rather as a kind of rule of human embodiment or fragility or mortality. There are lots of words that we can use. Um, emblems of solidarity. And to maybe try to bring the concept of joy uh, into the concept of care. Um, That's a really interesting. Jewels of care, uh, uh, of death and dying. I mean, the other side of the Pieta, of course, uh, in terms of Marian iconography is, and I mentioned this yesterday, the uh, images of the Madonna and child. Uh, particularly, I'm interested in um, a um, representational uh, scene, if you will, uh, that is called Maria Lactans, which is uh, the, the mother and child, Mary and the baby Jesus, in which she's uh, breastfeeding uh, the baby. And very often you see uh, Mary uh, expressing milk from her breasts, squirting it out into, uh, into the world, sometimes into the baby Jesus's mouth or just kind of forward. So, uh, the holiness of, uh, of Mary's tears, uh, the sacred aspect of Mary's milk, breast milk, uh, and the uh, emblems of what breast milk might represent in the world for uh, a form of joy that comes from human embodiment and care relations, uh, I think needs to be explored as well. Um, yeah. Uh, washing, for example, uh, rituals of ablution are also an important part of care ethics uh, that uh, can be explored uh, because, of course, women uh, are charged with the work of, uh, of ablution, of washing uh, human bodies, both in life and in death. Yeah. So there are many other elements, I think, of these uh, corporeal entanglements that are represented in sacred um, works of art that I would yeah. like to explore as well. That's beautiful. That's uh, beautiful. Again, disability joy everywhere. Yeah. So maybe actually we're seeing a lot, I'm seeing a lot of love for disability joy in the Zoom chat as well here. So I wonder if we want to use this moment to shift to show two other, um, a couple of other images that you and I uh, prepared, uh, drawn again from, but this time from contemporary arts, from uh, disability dance. Uh, we'll, so I'll uh, show those two images and give some image descriptions and then we'll talk a little bit about them as well to, um, to in flesh, literally in flesh, this other dimension of, um, of disability and, and joy. Okay. So. All right, so on the screen now is an image from Alice Shepard and Laura Lawson's Descent. It's a kinetic light performance, 2017. Rosemary and I were both alive in attendance. Rosemary, I think this was the last time you and I saw each other in the flesh. What an amazing um, event this was. In the still from the performance, two women in wheelchairs dance on a dark, atmospherically lit stage. Alice, a multiracial black woman, lies on her back with her arms outstretched. Her wheelchair is tilted upward. Laurel, a white woman, balances on Alice's knees. Her arms are also spread wide and her wheelchair is high in the air as if suspended in flight. In the second image that I'd like to show, Alice and Laura, Laurel pause in their wheelchairs, facing each other on a long, wide ramp. The ramp has a striking curve, and it's lit with luminous purples and blues in front of a cosmic sky. It's lit with stars and pools of color, deep orange, vivid green and midnight blue. The two women face each other, head 
shoulders tilted toward each other. Laurel's hands are touching Alice's knees. Julia, would, will you talk about the work um, uh, the liberation work, the aesthetic work, the opportunities for witnessing that uh, disability dance uh, offers us. Yeah. Um, you and I have talked about this so much before and you participate, I know, in, uh, in dance. Uh, one of the things that strikes me about the image that you just described uh, is the ramp itself. I wanna talk a little bit about this. Um, this ramp, that is central, it's, it really is the stage, but it's also an aesthetic implement in um, this uh, performance called Descent. Uh, <clears throat> but one of the things, uh, there are many moves. I mentioned this, I think yesterday, one of the things about disability dance is that it offers an opportunity for a whole new movement vocabulary in an art form that um, has, has been uh, utterly transformed by uh, disability dance, uh, particularly by the use of the wheelchair as an aesthetic uh, uh, instrument, as opposed to a medical instrument. And uh, on the ramp, which was designed by our colleague, Sarah Hendren, uh, who is uh, an engineer and architect uh, at Olin College. Uh, one of the things that can take place because the ramp undulates um, is that uh, in that particular scene that Julia describes, Laurel and Alice rock, uh, kind of in both senses, but let me say rock as in rocking the cradle in a beautiful way. So that becomes one of these choreographic moves that is only possible when the wheelchair is introduced as the aesthetic instrument. And so in that particular choreography, they rock and rock and rock and rock on that ramp. And of course, this is the idea of rocking is a, uh, you know, it's a care choreography uh, that has, I hadn't even thought about this, that um, women in particular have been carrying out throughout all of human history. And we could witness rocking in so many different ways um, with the um, implements that are built in the world for care from rocking chairs to rocking wheelchairs to cradles uh, to many different kinds of, um, of uh, tools, if you will, that the world offers to us uh, that allow us to comfort one another and to comfort ourselves through rocking. Yeah. Rosemary, one of the things I love about disability dance is the way that it centers the question, what does disability make possible? What can disability bring into the world? It is the interest that disability arts and disability art makers bring to disability as a generative practice, right? Disability as a generative way of being in the world, as a way that requires demands, but also makes possible a certain kind of thing that is otherwise not possible. I remember the first time I saw um, a wheelchair dance that, was, that had been choreographed by disabled choreographers. Um, I remember thinking, I always knew wheelchairs were beautiful but I had never seen it. I had never felt it viscerally before and had never known it to be witnessable to others as well. I think that one of the things that draws me to the work of a lot of disability arts, or one of the things that first drew me to the work of disability arts was the wow factor 
the like bet you didn't know wheelchairs or crutch users or whoever could 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 do that could make that could bring this sort of beauty into the world that element remains like remains a through line and a source of pleasure for me aesthetic pleasure but also political pleasure i like that yeah but I'm also increasingly interested in the way that disability arts also make manifest a combination of extraordinary virtuosity and also the kind of embodied physicality of what we might in other contexts call vulnerability, but in a really different context, okay? We, so I think about, um, you know, in Descent, for example, we hear you, you, I, I remember sitting very close to the, to the stage and feeling Alice and Laurel's wheelchairs rock the stage. This is a different kind of rocking than the, the gentle rocking that you're describing. Like I could feel the impact the vibration as a wheelchair user myself i feel vibration very keenly through my own wheels it runs back up through my body right so the communicative nature of that vibration the feeling of right the recognition of their bodies right as athletes in motion but also right doing things that are charged with joy and risk um, that I feel invites us to consider right, the athlete, for example, right? The, the as right, the dancer also as a body who experiences contact, risk, injury pain, that these things like go hand in hand also with the making and bringing of beauty into the world. It's, it's as we're talking now, Rosemary, I think it's striking to me how different that is than the dichotomy that we began with first, where one care agent, right, offers, right, sort of bends down to the, um, to the object of the, uh, of the vulnerability object. And instead gives us a kind of intermingled image of the body as both extraordinary and vulnerable in the very same moment. The, I'm struck also, I think, about the sexiness of this show, right? The like, oh, the, the yes. Of the and the way the invitation to like let that right so you were you were you drew that beautiful connection to the image of rocking almost like the maternal image okay but I think also there's a re and and those moments of tenderness right and physical care for one another run through the piece but there's also an extraordinary sensuality in this work, um, a sense that bodies and wheels get intertwined together, tangled up in each other in a way that is um, unabashedly joyful, censuring pleasure and satisfaction in ways that also feel to me to be something I want to claim as deeply sacred, right? As really part of that, that sense of what feels most, um, what feels most sacred, most alive about this piece. That's wonderful. Yesterday, um, we had a call for uh, boots on the ground. <laughs> and what I want to say is, uh, I think what we all need to do is to go from here back to our spaces, wherever our spaces are, back to our institutions, back to our homes, back to our communities, and think about how we can bring uh, 
the culture of disability, um, if you will, the material culture of disability, whether it's, you know, uh, have a book group at your school or your church. Uh, if you have a Catholic church with a Pieta in it, um, have a sermon around, I don't know, care ethics in the Pieta, uh, show disability dance, go do that work, bring this to your communities. Um, and bring the idea of disability joy uh, to dislodge the uh, perpetual association of lament and disability, but also to honor uh, the long history of lament and to honor uh, touching uh, and uh, the, the particular kind of, of touching that uh, care um, allows us to, to think about in these expansive ways. Um, so, you know, no more boots on the ground. We want wheels on the ground, wheels on the ramp <laughs> um, as a, one of our slogans. I um, love that, Rosemary. Yeah. We have a couple of questions in the that have come into the Q and A, and so I wonder if I might share those um, with uh, with you, and um, so that we can also think together about them a little bit. So the um, beautiful question, uh, reflection, and question from Jody Powers, uh, who says, "Rosemary, I have never realized how sacred art so often depicts." Uh, so often depicts disabled bodies. My body is very obviously disabled. I have felt so seen and validated through these sacred arts. Thank you for introducing us. Today, images of the disabled are so rare. How do you think we got from depicting disabled bodies to completely ignoring the disabled body? I don't think we ignore the disabled body ever in anything that human beings make. Our job is to find what we think of as the disabled body in all of the cultural products, in all of the human relationships, in all of the structures and things that we make together as human beings find disability or what we think of as disability in all those places and bring them forward. Yeah, I would just add here that I think it's really interesting the way, you know, we have been, we focused for the first part of our conversation, particularly on images of, um, of, of Jesus who in Christian context is, and in a Christian, broadly Christian culture, even for those of us who, who don't identify as Christian, is so often understood quintessentially as uh, like disabled, but not disabled, right? So I think there's also a question of integration. It's been really powerful for me to reflect on the cultural work that happens by juxtaposition, by bringing together sacred images that are often read in ways that don't center disability narratives, even though they could, as Nancy Eastland has shown, so, so easily and generatively be, be read as right, the body of a disabled God. Okay? And yet, there's something, I think, powerful about bringing bringing embodied, physical, enfleshed, like actual ordinary disabled folks into, into the room, as it were, with this kind of sacred iconography. Sometimes the sacredness actually shuts the door on kinship and connection. And, you know, I, th I think that 
this is one place where stitching together, whether through contemporary disability arts or through other kinds of narrative work, cultural work, the cultural work of provocative juxtapositions might be another helpful way of, um, of, of avoiding this tendency of um, valorizing only a few exemplars right, of disabled bodies and instead creating a sort of more diverse field where we see and recognize and perceive and know um, how ubiquitous disability is both within sacred and secular context. Well, part of what I think we want to do is to transform the secular into the sacred in order for it to do the kind of work that it does. And of course, the that image that I was reading as a Pieta of the man holding the old person on his lap might not be read as sacred unless one understands the reference um, uh, to the Pieta and the long tradition of the Pieta. So the work of making uh, making the making things in the world sacred, making yes. the use of a wheelchair into a sacred act yeah. is part of what we want to do. And that's a narrative or a rhetorical project yeah. Yeah. that I think all of us um, involve ourselves. With. And of course, Alice and uh, Laurel would be, I mean, as two, queer secular artists, right, who weren't making sacred art. Um, I spend a lot of my time working and immersing myself very deeply in disability art that is unabashedly secular, right? Um, and thinking with and unearthing some of the ways in which I feel that it speaks um, or can speak also a sacred language. I want to uh, turn to a question um, that we received from David Gaze. Thank you, David. Um, David says, thank you both. I think authentic disability care requires mutuality. We both give and receive, experiencing both joy and lament in different moments of our lives. Could you discuss the reciprocity of disability care? Um, this is a very important point, the idea of interdependence, the idea of reciprocity that is brought forward, um, I think, quite clearly in the enterprise of care ethics, um, in particular uh, for, uh, I think, our work is the work of um, the philosopher Eva Kate, who talks about uh, the prevalence, and many people do, but let me just talk about Eva Kate. She's a philosopher who has a, a significantly disabled daughter. And um, the daughter is an occasion for Eva Kate as a philosopher to think about questions such as uh, the ideologies of uh, individualism and autonomy that make care and the work of care and the position of dependence uh, understood as a uh, degraded uh, way of being in the world. And uh, that's a, an important part of care ethics to think about care relations as a form of inter dependence, uh, to think about uh, touching and mutuality in terms of touching uh, as um, a, a sacred act. Eva Kate doesn't talk about sacred acts, but um, her work is very important in this respect. And there are a number of other uh, philosophers uh, that have brought forward care and the ethics of touching, um, the ethics of beholding um, in terms of the recognition of the face of the other. There are a number of 
traditions uh, that I think we can pull into our own work uh, about embodied interchanges, about touching and the mutuality of touching rather than imagining care as a kind of hierarchical relationship um, that these images are an occasion, I think, to uh, have conversations about. Yeah. I have also just will add to Rosemary, to your beautiful answer, that I've been thinking a lot lately about the physicality of giving care as a disabled person um, and the complexity of that. The, the I, I think in my own life, it's been helpful to realize that I want and need to spend time working out with the folks I love and care for what the choreography of my giving care will, will actually look like. Realizing that we don't always immediately know how we're going to make it work doesn't mean that it's just impossible, that it can't be done, right? Allows us also to create and open a space where we bring ingenuity and disability expertise into the caregiving, care offering, care mutuality meld um, itself. Um, but for me, it's been really helpful to realize that um, we can open up a space of figuring that out as a kind of disability affirming space that just because I can't lift in a certain way or bend in a certain way that might seem to be a prerequisite for offering certain kinds of care doesn't actually mean that all of the physical tasks of, of touch we're offering are always necessarily foreclosed to me. Okay? And so of course, knowing that bodies and minds are all different, that we're always kind of trying to figure out what's actually um, possible and good and right for our, um, for our bodies and minds in the moment. I'm really interested also in those spaces where we might open up more capacity to think about the, the, the physicality of caring and caring for each other. We are at this moment, of course, uh, as a culture, as a society, so attuned to uh, the asymmetries of what we think of as power relations, that I think it's a very important opportunity for rethinking, uh, for introducing the idea of mutuality and interdependence in all sorts of relationships. Uh, and thinking about this kind of interdependence and mutuality in care relations in which disability is involved uh, will help us, I think, understand the complexities of what we think of as these asymmetries of power and position. Beautiful. In, I, I think we're gonna take a question now from the, um, we're gonna take some questions from the room. All right, we're going to start with the one this lecture is named after Bill Gaventis first. So comment, just some things that you've sparked in my mind while we're thinking uh, about the similarities between the Pietas and the dancers is that the lamentation in the Pietas almost seems to be of a person who has lost their dancing part who's lying in their lap, um, it, you know, that there's that kind of, of looking at, at like, where's this, where's this dance of care going, so to speak. Uh, 
and I think about the song that's a lot of Christians know, I am the Lord of dance, uh, you know, said he, I'm a terrible dancer. I get me on the dance floor for anything, but, but, but I think about dance and, and the kind of capacity to kind of move, uh, with things and ideas and other kinds of things. So I, but so my question to you is, is looking at art and the secular and sacredness of art around disability, a place where disability theology and disability studies can come together. Because there's a lot of uh, in the past, a fair amount of uncertainty on each side about how those two disciplines and fields dance with each other. Yeah. Well, that's so beautiful. Yes, <laughs> yes thank you. Um, the thing about witnessing disability dance, um, the work that that might do in the world is for someone like you, Bill, to be able to come up with a different story about yourself than the story of I'm a terrible dancer. And so to, to offer new stories and new ways of thinking about living in the world is what we want this thing we call disability art to do. That's it's really beautiful, Bill, what you were noting about the, the way the tenderness and the loss, the lament that we see in the Pieta is also as if all, already encoded in the love and the eros and the profound connection and embodied trust between the dancers on stage. Um, it's extraordinary to think about that juxtaposition and that way of sacralizing, right? Of making and recognizing the sacredness of, um, I would say the physicality of trust that is always present between, um, or that is present between the, the dance partners. Right? The, the way they know each other's bodies and physical capacities and strengths and vulnerabilities and weaknesses intimately, they have to. Uh, I actually think one of the joys of disability arts is you don't have to do it to love it. So that in the same way that you don't have to touch the art necessarily to experience pleasure in the in the qualities of the art. Um, I think there's something about being in the presence of art that can also open up a sort of spaciousness within us, even if we are not ourselves moved to, um, to do it or to try it. Alice actually tells a funny story where she says, wheelchair users always, always seem to want to try out her ramp. And she's like, no, you can't get on the ramp. It's, it's dangerous. This is a ramp that is designed for um, right, a tremendously high level of athletic, artistic expertise. Um, folks fall off this ramp all the time. Right? So I think there's also something here about what art opens for us, even if we are not partaking in it. Um, and I love that idea that art might be a place, disability art might be a place where disability studies and disability theology can find a kind of generative space to play together, to think about culture and um, interpretation and the politics of, of this, right, of, of this work um, in a space where we're, we're sort of all invited into um, uh, art as kind of playground, imagination ground, right? As Rosemary said at the beginning, an invitation for world building. I don't know how much time we have, but it might be worthwhile um, talking about uh, the image, I think we have it up there, of um, Judith Scott embracing 
her sculpture. Great, I'll cue that up. Uh, I don't, how much time do we have? I don't know, we need to hear from Kathy maybe. We, we just have a, we have a few more questions out here and then we're going to lunch. So if you wanna show it quickly, you probably, okay. Let, okay. Let's just offer this image. Um, we've been talking a lot about dance um, and about uh, art itself. This is a photograph of the uh, sculptor artist, Judith Scott. And uh, it's a black and white photograph. Uh, Judith Scott was born in 1943 and she died in 2005. She is an artist uh, who is non-speaking, uh, probably deaf. She has Down syndrome. And she began her work as an artist when she was taken by her sister uh, to some kind of a craft workshop in uh, Oakland, California, uh, where there was fiber sitting in bins and she began to wrap the fiber and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and wrapped and made uh, one sculpture after another. This is fiber art. So uh, in this black and white photograph, Judith Scott uh, is embracing one of her sculptures. And the sculpture looks like um, a, uh, a skein of yarn wrapped up. It's uh, uh, large through the middle and, and sort of pointed a little bit. It looks like a, a, a Greek amphora in some ways. And it's a very powerful image of embrace of the maker embracing that which she has made. And I think it can be understood as a conversation uh, between this image and the work of Judith Scott and say uh, the image of uh, Mary the mother, Mary the Madonna in uh, the various choreographies of care and making that we see in that particular aesthetic tradition. Um, and uh, Judith Scott, Judith Scott's work is everywhere in the world. Um, she began, I think, as what we might, what the art world, world calls an outsider artist, which is a fairly offensive term, but it does certain work. And um, I was uh, invited to come to the first solo exhibition at the Brooklyn Museum, um, meaning a single artist exhibition. And it was an exhibition of sculpture by Judith Scott. Uh, and so that kind of work is important. One of the things we can do is go back to our spaces and grow where we are planted. We can um, organize events which bring uh, what we're calling here together, Julie and I are calling this disability art and um, the, the, the ethical, moral, political and social work that it can do and organize something at your institutions. Introduce the, you know, introduce Judith Scott, show Crip Camp, uh, talk about the Pieta, uh, do any of these things, learn about this and bring it forward into your institutions. That's the kind of world building and world changing uh, work that we can, we can do together that comes from disability arts and culture. All right, Rosemary, we have three questions I hear from Kathy. We have three questions in the room and we have three minutes in which to um, respond. So my proposal is let's hear the three questions. And then, and there's one more question in the Q&A, which I will read. And then you'll say something in, in what, short in response, and I'll say something short in response, and then we'll close so that those who are at the Institute in the flesh can go to lunch, all right? So let's hear the, those three questions. Okay, this is fun. I'm, I'm very excited about this. Um, so we had one question drop, so we'll do two in the okay. room and the one uh, that you have right here. Beautiful. So, Chantal, unique from Christian, your Um, Thank you for your talk. 
uh, I, you said two things that I need to carry with me moving forward. Wheelchairs are beautiful. I always knew that. And also um, the wow factor of that you didn't know I could do that. Um, that could be the tagline for my book, I think. Uh, the one thing that I don't quite understand and I'm not sure how to integrate is the idea of disability as an emblem of solidarity. If you have more to say about that, that would be helpful. Because I love solidarity. Not so sure I love emblems or being one, but you can unpack that for me. That'd be awesome. Thanks. All right, let's go ahead and hear the, uh, the other question. Thank you. This is a beautiful question. Hi, this is Alex Sider. Um, I, I was struck in both of your comments about the, uh, uh, well, Rosemary's language of uh, emplacement and uh, the way that, for instance, the Pieta is in place. It's centrally, it, it, I mean, it's in St. Peter's Basilica. Um, it reminded me of a long conversation or a conversation a while ago amongst um, Nell Noddings and Joan Toronto um, and Virginia Held, where Nodding said uh, the ethics of care is interpersonal. And Toronto and, and um, Virginia Held said, no, no, don't, don't cede uh, the public justice work of care to um, people like Kohlberg and, and um, uh, Rawls by saying, by just making care interpersonal. Care is political, the personal is the political, care is social. I'm wondering if you could talk at all about what it means institutionally that the Pieta has this intensely interpersonal depiction of care is in the Vatican. Great. Whew. And the third question, um, Tamara Puffer and Michael Gov uh, Golovic ask or say, most of those in my faith community experience disability as older adults. Their disabilities are always framed in a negative way, loss of function, pain, inconvenience, etc. Add to this how older adults are often joked about being less able, ignorant about technology and the like. How can we frame older adults and their disabilities with joy. So Rosemary, we have set ourselves quite a task and that there's really very little time left. So I would just say if there's something that you would want to lift up in closing, um, that would be lovely. I do want to lift up uh, the idea of story and uh, uh, to find stories about disability and how people with disabilities live lives, how people with disabilities flourish. I wanna charge all of us with finding those stories, making those stories and creating in our spaces. So in placement, we wanna look for <laughs> implotment in in placement. How's that for pretension? Um, we want to find stories, make stories together um, about the ways that human beings can flourish with and without disabilities and to bring those stories forward in our lives, in our communities. And that's disability solidarity, I think. I'll just add on the subject of solidarity and joy that I think about solidarity. I too am not interested in being anybody else's emblem, but I am interested in thinking about the way my own experience might offer um, paths for others to chart or note or explore their, the, the terrain of solidarity of disability 
um, experience in their own lives. And on the subject of joy, I would say that I'm most interested in the little joys, not the idea of disability itself as always or necessarily about joy, right? But the way in which a tuning toward the small, tiny joys and satisfactions of the life that we live might open up a space for um, a really different way of moving in and through this world. Thank you so much. It's been a huge, huge pleasure, Rosemary, to be in conversation with you and Institute friends to get to hear from and see some of your faces and your, um, your words and warm presence on the Zoom screen as well. Thank you. Here's to slow joy. Thank you, both of you. Let's give them one big hand again.